comments and feedbacks and thoughts that, that you have. So thank you again for participating. Uh, thank you again for your commitment and thank you again for what you're doing for the future of our, uh, of our students and the future of our uh, community and quality of life that we, uh, that we want in this uh, ADIP school. Thank you, uh, Craig, I turn it back over to you. Well, thank you, Mr. Ryland, and good to see you, sir. Next, we're going to get things working with um, Miss Kimberly Crow, who, let me tell you, has been a godsend in helping uh, run the technical side of things behind the scenes. So, Kimberly Crow, you're going to walk us through a few things. And is it is it time for me to share my screen? I've, I've already done it. Yes, if you want to, if you want to go ahead and share your the PowerPoint. Okay. And while Craig is getting to that slide, I can go ahead and start talking. So basically we wanna go over a few brief things with you. And most importantly, we want you to feel very important with Zoom. So if any time in the next week or so, the next day or so, you have questions about, because you can't figure something out, feel free to reach out to any of us in ALEAF. We are here to help you because we so much appreciate you being a part of this process. One of the things that's important for us so that we can find who you are is that you set your account so that your name appears as your name instead of as your phone number. Um, this is, can be easily done in your, on your upper right-hand screen of your Zoom account. The next thing is to keep your microphone on mute. As you keep your microphone on mute, unless you're speaking, then it doesn't cause interruptions and, and, and cause people not to be able to hear things. Also, if you're having a connectivity issue, one of the things that can help is turning your camera off. Um, and then just remember to turn it back on if you have a question or you wanna speak. But that is one way that kind of keeps the, your, your internet from getting clogged. We're gonna do a series of breakout rooms tonight. So we're gonna have part of the meeting. We're all gonna be here together. <coughs> then we're gonna go to a breakout session where we, uh, we send you to what's called a breakout room please accept your breakout room um, invitation. It'll, it'll be a little click on your screen. Once you're there, make sure you don't leave. It may take a little while for other people to come and join you. Um, if you've been in there for five minutes and nobody else has come to join you, then you can leave it and we can manually send you back out and help you troubleshoot. Um, the last but not least is when, you, when it's time to end, those rooms are gonna end and you're gonna automatically come back out into the big group as you see the big Brady Brunch right now. So that's pretty much all I have to say. So Craig, it's back to the next person. I'll take a stab at this. Um, I got it, Craig. Oh, you got it. But let me yeah. remind everybody who's not speaking, please put yourself on mute and make sure your devices are muted as well. Uh, we have uh, 70 some odd people on this call. And um, if we're all unmuted and our devices are on loud ring, it'll interrupt the presenters. So please do a courtesy to the presenters, keep yourself on mute unless you're speaking and keep your device on silent or vibrate as well. Thanks. Thanks, Craig. Good evening, committee. It's so good to be back with you again. Uh, I met you at our last meeting. Some of you I will already know because we worked together on the bond in 2015. My name is Michelle Hughes. I'm your facilitator. That means I'm the advocate for this committee. And so I am uh, ready to try to help you do your best work. And I believe that as we go along, you'll find yourself not wanting to be anywhere else but in these meetings. ALEAF ISD has worked so hard, uh, as most of all of you probably did during the recent uh, weather, and uh, yet you're here. And I just, I congratulate you because that was really a week lost and the people at the district have had to jump through hoops to try to get everything ready uh, for tonight. I just I had a couple of things to tell you. Uh, one is that you don't have to worry about taking a lot of notes because all of the information and materials will be on the ALEAF ISD uh, website, the bond steering committee tab. You'll be able to get to anything that we talk about tonight. And as Craig uh, or as Ed said, we want you to ask questions. We don't want anyone to leave confused or without information. 
So you feel free to ask any questions during your small groups and we will make sure that not only the questions that we answer publicly, but the other ones that we don't get to are answered on that uh, tab on the website. We do have a, a, a um, guideline for ourselves. If somebody misses three consecutive meetings who's on the committee, we're going to just not send any more emails and bother you or clutter your, uh, your inbox with that. Uh, we just didn't, will interpret that unless you've called and told uh, Craig that you're not going to be there. We'll interpret that as you, you're not interested at this time. And so we'll just quit sending you the notifications. Anything, if you miss a meeting and you have some catch up work to do because the meetings are very uh, content rich. And if you have con if you have catch up work that you need to do, you will need all the information to make good decisions. So, if, but if you have to catch up, you'll have to catch yourself up by visiting that tab on the website and seeing the presentations that, uh, that were made. So let's talk about how we're going to work together. This is new for me. I've not done a, uh, the next slide, uh, Craig. I've not done a uh, bond committee in this way, in this venue before. And I think it's gonna be new for all of us, but. It may be just a lot of fun. And I'll ask you if we make some mistakes and have some technology glitches, please have mercy on us. And we're, we're, we're doing the very best we can to learn how to, to manage content and people on a, electronically. These are some ground rules that I've used in other groups. And typically I would, if we were in, together um, in person, I would ask you if you had anything on these ground rules that you wanted to add, but uh, we'll just, I'm gonna go over them right now, but I will not go over them anymore, but I, I may re reference them if we have a problem with them. But uh, I'm just gonna ask you in your, in your breakout groups, uh, if you'll just uh, uh, contribute to the conversation there without monopolizing it. We're going to make sure that we honor our time contract. We're going to stay on task and on topic. Uh, share your ideas freely. There is no duck shooting, and that means we don't get to say we did it that way in 1976 and it didn't work. So we hope that you'll uh, listen with the intent to understand and not to reply. Think holistically. Uh, that's that seemed to be really easy for ALEAF in 2015 to consider the whole district and every kid and not just the kid uh, that goes to your school. So we just ask you to intentionally uh, sublimate your, your personal ideas and, and listen and, uh, for what's good for the district as a whole. And this is something I never would have to remind ALEAF people about. Uh, because I, I think you're the kindest, nicest group that, that I've worked with. So continue that way. Be kind, be honest. Don't let your telephones ring or your phones go off. Uh, I'm glad I said that because I forgot to turn mine off. Uh, while we're working, uh, share the conversation. Try to get people who are uh, quieter to talk uh, while you're having the breakout rooms and be relentless in pursuing consensus. And we'll talk more about what consensus is as we define it later. And then I just really would like for you to have fun. Uh, my contact information is, all, is in your, uh, among these slides. And so you can always call, email, text, anything, any ideas that you have or anything that you'd like to, uh, to tell us. Okay, next slide. I want to uh, get, I want to tell you how we're going to process. I, I think people do much better when they know what to expect. And so I want to give you an idea of how we're going to get through this uh, together. First of all, I use, you have in your possession uh, what's called a task cycle. And that, uh, some people would call it an agenda, but it's really an agenda on steroids. It's a tool that I used, uh, learned uh, probably 25 years ago from ExxonMobil, and it has worked in every high-risk group I've ever facilitated. And I consider yours a high, when I say high-risk, I just mean the topics are so hot. And so we'll, 
uh, will use that that task cycle to guide us through uh, through the content of the meeting. Uh, the meeting schedule that tells you what's going to be covered in each meeting is on page three of your task cycle, and well, actually page two and three. And that just tells you what the shaded portion is the meeting that we're on and then the other meetings and their content are listed. It's, it's a rather uh, dynamic and uh, organic document because there sometimes we make changes. We had to make a change tonight because uh, we're, we're adapting sometimes at the, at the last minute. But that tells you what the content is. Um, the, we're going to have experts from the district make individual, um, um, get in a minute, Craig, I'll ask you to switch to it. Uh, we're gonna have experts from the district um, give presentations in, in areas about some needs in A-Leave ISD. So they'll make a presentation. Uh, at some point, I'll try to give you time to process that information in your smaller groups that I'm going to call work groups. And so that's how we'll do it. Then you'll come back and we'll take one question from each one of the groups. So you don't have to worry about that, but I just want you to know what's coming. How will we make decisions? Uh, slide eight, Craig, if you'll let them look at that. Uh, this is a... a decision-making model that I've used for quite some time. And I'd like to suggest that this, that our group use it as well. Unless you have a real strong um, uh, aversion to it, you can email me that, but this is, this has worked really well in all the other groups. First of all, we strive for consensus and that I'll define consensus in a way uh, later on when we get to that piece of the meetings, but we strive for consensus. It doesn't mean unanimity. It doesn't mean that 100% of the committee have to agree. It simply means that no one vetoes. But consensus doesn't block our decision uh, because we move, if we're unable to get consensus, which is uh, the absence of a veto, then we move to what I call an 80% rule. And that is an 80, if 80% 80 of the people on the committee agree that a decision is good, then it's very sustainable. And we will certainly go with that. Uh, we move from that to a super majority of two thirds. Uh, I rarely have to use that piece of the decision making because usually by the time we give you an, all the information you need, a decision emerges fairly easily for you. Should we be unable to reach an 80% uh, of the committee, we will reluctantly move to voting. And that means a super majority of two thirds. Now you may say, if you're voting, why don't you have a, a simple majority of 51%? Well, the reason is based on research that I've done and experiences that I've had, you can't pass a bond with 51% of the committee agreeing. So we make it hard. We say, okay, to, uh, for this decision to, to go forward, it has to have at the very minimum, a super majority of two thirds. Okay, back to, well, let's go to slide nine, uh, Craig. This is another critical document and I hope you'll be referring to it quite a bit. It's the, um, the priority schedule that we're gonna use. As we go through these presentations, we're gonna be giving you projects that, that the district has identified as, uh, as needed over the last, over the next 10 years actually. But they've categorized those projects into uh, priorities. And the, if a project has a priority one, that means that it, it meets these criteria that are listed there under priority one, either it, uh, something legal, safety, critical replacements, upgrades, growth, something programmatic. It may be life cycle, but that it's something that's, uh, that's critical enough that it needs to be done in one to three years. The projects, the next level of projects are priority two projects, and we call those should do's. And those may be curricular things that are related uh, that, which are programmatic also, 
instructional program needs and life cycle, meaning that something has reached the end of its life or it will in the next three to six years. And then priority threes are the vision, are the things that we know are going to fail or we're going to have to replace or enhance uh, within the next six to 10 years. So you'll be, uh, you'll be selecting uh, projects based on priorities, but you'll also be selecting them based on cost. So you're putting pieces of a puzzle together uh, that are, it's very complex work that you're going to be doing, but you don't worry about that because we'll make sure that you have every bit of information that you need. Okay, uh, if you can go back to the, the other slide, uh, Craig, the process slide to what two back. One more back. Okay, right here. Okay, so how will your questions and feedback be handled on Zoom? Uh, we've we've talked this through and and, and Cam has practiced. When, when we go to those breakout rooms, uh, we'll have we'll we'll use the chat for you to ask questions through your uh, facilitator. And this is a good time for me to tell you that you're going to have a district facilitator in your group, but they are only there to help guide the process. They are neutral to the content, so they won't be uh, moving you in any certain direction or. So, Michelle, you, you're muted now. You, you're muted. Michelle, we cannot hear you, my friend. Yeah, you're muted. Okay, now, am I good? I didn't do anything, but um, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Okay, I don't know where, you, where I cut out, but something just appeared on my screen and said I was muted. So I don't know what I did, but isn't that the first question that technology people ask you when something bad happens? <laughs> what did you do? Um, so that's how your question, I told you how your questions will be handled. We're gonna take one question from a group, but we're gonna answer all the questions online. When will I know, that this is what every, uh, every committee wants to know, when will I know the tax impact and the financial data to make uh, good decisions? You're gonna find out about the tax impact and the financial information at meeting five. And the reason I do that is because I want your decisions to be uh, primarily guided by what the needs are and what you want thinks important for your children to have in ALE and not by how much does, now that it, it definitely is a factor. We're not uh, saying that that is not a consideration because it is. So we'll, we'll get to that piece in meeting number five and that's on April 29th. And then how will we make our final decisions? Uh, you're gonna be considering your decisions about the bond uh, individually uh, starting at meeting number five also but then you're going to make your final decision at meeting number six, which is on May 13th. That's when you'll actually deliberate and make your decisions. So if you have any uh, questions about that, you can email me and ask me. I think that would be the, if it's a process question, that might be the best way to do it. Now I'd like for you to look, uh, next slide, um, Craig, I'd like for you to glance at the note to the charter. The charter is a, a document that describes your scope of work in a way that is, is very clear. And I know you have a copy of that. So I'd like for you to just look at it for a minute and make sure that, that uh, you understand everything that's on there. The main thing I want to call your attention to, and I'm so happy to see board members uh, with us tonight, and, and thank you, Ms. Williams, for giving your time uh, and, and being here. Um, the main thing that I'd like to call your attention to is a parameter or constraint, and that is that the board, uh, your, recommend that your 
group is chartered to give the board a recommendation, but the uh, board of trustees takes final action on a bond referendum. So the decision about it is theirs. We'll do the, we'll do the boots on the ground, the hard work of, of looking at every project and making our selections, but we'll send that as a, in the form of a recommendation to the board of trustees uh, for action. So let me give you just a second to look at that for a moment. I'll also call your attention to that uh, follow-up responsibility of the committee, and that is to participate in the bond in any bond meetings uh, that are called by the board of trustees, public uh, meetings to make people aware of the bond. So your work doesn't end when the committee is through. Uh, a bond referendum is when a committee puts it together; they own it. And so we would hope that each of you would be actively involved in promoting your work in the community. Okay, I think I'm through. I promise, I know I have a, a deep Texas accent and I promise you, you won't have to listen to me this much at any other meeting from now on. So let's move on to a brief review of our last meeting. And that's by uh, Deanna Wentz, our uh, Assistant Superintendent of Finance, and then Hilda Rodriguez, our Assistant Superintendent of Support Services. Deanna, are you ready to go? I am ready. Good evening, everyone. We just wanted to briefly review some of the district's high-level um, finances and be really clear on the distinction between our general fund and the debt service fund. So the general fund is what's used to fund the majority of our district operations. So all of our salaries, our regular monthly bills, minor repairs, campus supplies, those are funded through the maintenance and operations or general fund portion of the tax rate, as well as through our state for formula funding. What we're most concerned about um, in our work through this committee is the debt service fund. The only allowable expenses in the debt service funds are for the repayment of the debt that's issued as a result of this referendum. So that's funded 100% um, at this time by local taxes collected um, through the interest and in sinking fund portion of our tax rate. So these two things are completely separate. For example, we can't use money um, that we raise through the INS portion of our tax rate to pay for a teacher salary increase. We can't use um, um, the debt service fund to fund, we use the debt service fund to fund big ticket capital items that we're going to issue debt and then repay over a 20 year time period. So on the next slide, This is just a quick overview of um, ALEAF's tax rate history. And you can see the bulk of our tax rate is this green bar or the maintenance and operations general fund rate. The small portion up here is the rate that's used to um, fund the debt that we are going to issue as a result of this rep referendum. So each year our board of trustees meets in August and reviews the debt requirements for the next year, the amount of the payments that we're gonna have to make for both principal and interest and sets that tax rate in order to meet those debt requirements. So what we'll be working on and um, presenting at the end of April in that meeting in more detail is the, on the next slide please, is the implications um, from the projects that this committee decides to recommend to the board, what the implication will be for our district tax rate. So back in 2015, when we were going through this process prior to the referendum, our tax rate was 15 and a half cents. And we projected that we would need an eight and a half cent increase over the next six years in order to fund the debt that we were going to issue. 
Instead of eight and a half cents, we're currently projecting a five cent increase during the timeline covered by this referendum. So right now we're um, in fiscal year 2021 with a tax rate of 20 and a half cents. We expect that to remain flat, although it's not adopted yet for 21-22. So that will be a five cent increase rather than an eight and a half cent increase. And that's because um, when we're building these projections, our crystal ball only works so well. So um, because increases in property value were a little higher than what we were projecting back in 2015, and because interest rates have been lower, we've been able to keep that tax rate lower than what we publicized and promoted during the last referendum, which is good news. We only increase the tax rate what we need in order to fund the debt that we're going to issue to finance the projects. So now I will turn it over to Hilda. Good evening, Good evening everyone. Um, Dr. Rodriguez, the superintendent, but also the judicial co chair. Um, I'm so glad I didn't have a chance to address you earlier, but I, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, this evening and participating uh, with us in the committee. Uh, we, uh, you know, last, last, uh, the last time we met, I know I did a lot of talking last time, so I have a very short role of talking this, this time just to review a few data points with you. Uh, but I do want to thank you for being here um, and spending time with us, and, and, and we really do value your input. Uh, anyways, let's take some time to review a few data points and provide an update on the 2015 bond referendum. Uh, of course, I've, as you know, Ailey today, it covers about 36.6 square miles of land in Southwest Houston. And we currently are serving um, 41,600 students in our community. Um, we, uh, we are a district, you can, you can move, Craig. We are a district that, uh, a very diverse community and uh, with a very diverse student population. Uh, but also just want to um, share some taper or review some taper report uh, data with you. Uh, our ECD, uh, uh, we have uh, economically disadvantaged students about 83.4% compared to the state, which is about 16.2% uh, of students that are economically disadvantaged. Our, also our LEP population is almost uh, twice as large at 45.9% of students who uh, are in our LEP programs. Our teacher staff make up, uh, they make up about 50% of um, our staff and that includes all district employees. So that would include also, you know, all of our maintenance and operation staff, custodial staff and so on. And it, uh, our teacher average experience is 8.2 compared to our state, the state average is 7.2% um, of average experience. And our teacher turnover rate is uh, only 14.4% compared to the state at 8.6. And uh, in the class of 2019 had a four-year uh, graduation rate of 90.2%, which is just right there at the state level as well. When we look so at you, our you, enrollment... Hilda, Hilda, real quick, what does the LEP stand for? You said the LEP, the LEP, what does that stand for again? Limited English proficient. So when we look at our enrollment trends, um, then this chart kind of gives you um, a good picture. Um, in 70, starting in 71, 72, as we progress through the years, you can see that our enrollment um, is climbing. And then, and then uh, starts to, uh, you know, decrease and kind of settle out and uh, in 06, 07, you can see it uh, as, the, as the enrollments become steady, kind of increases a bit in 14, 15, uh, and then starts to decrease uh, uh, in the last few years. Uh, in our current enrollment, uh, like I said today, it's just about 41,600 students. And just to remember that number is fluid, uh, you know, daily it can change uh, just from student mobility, um, students moving in and out of the district. Uh, 
Uh, just an overview of the 2015 bond referendum. Uh, we did go over that at the last meeting as well. Uh, you can see that we are in our last year of the bond referendum. Uh, and uh, we will be selling uh, bonds to fund the, the projects uh, for the upcoming year, which would be uh, adding additional school buses and capital improvements, um, and to also fund our uh, pre-K centers that we are constructing. Um, but over the years, this uh, we've done very varied projects in the 2015 bond referendum. Um, the voters approved $341 million. Um, this bond included large cell jobs, uh, such as new construction as a career center, uh, added six new gymnasiums at the middle schools, at all of our middle schools. Uh, but it also included some smaller projects like adding a thousand square feet to our uh, high school field houses and weight rooms, uh, upgraded uh, district-wide restrooms in several of our campuses. Um, and uh, so we had uh, you know, a lot of different projects uh, and they pretty much, as you can see in the fourth year, we had lots of projects that completed out. Uh, so really uh, we're looking at the last of the bond um, and finishing up our pre-K facilities. Um, as our last as our last projects. And uh, at this time, uh, I'll have Scott Molik. He's uh, will begin our our uh, presentations from our directors and our departments. So our our first presentation will begin with Scott Molig, director of athletics. Hello, there, may I, Scott? Just a minute. Uh, this is Michelle again. I wanted to remind you all, if you would not uh, ask your questions of the speakers while they're, while they're speaking, if you'll write down your questions and save them for uh, when you're in your uh, small group. And we'll try not to use uh, educational acronyms anymore. Thank you for catching <laughs> us on that. Thank you, Ed. Good evening, I'm Scott Mulligan. I'm the athletic director for ALEAF ISD. Craig, you can go to the next slide. And I'm gonna be talking about the, uh, the athletic bond recommendations. And I wanna thank uh, my, uh, our assistants, Tim Martin and uh, Marla uh, Brumfield Lewis for their assistance, as well as our coaches across the district, uh, giving us some feedback and some input. Uh, I wanna give you some brief context or a synopsis of, of athletics in ADF ISD. Uh, ADF has a rich tradition of success. We have several state playoff appearances annually by various teams, serve approximately 6,085 state participants in high school and middle, at the high school and middle school levels. Uh, you know, some of those kids are repeating kids, but it's, it's a, that's a good estimate. Serve approximately 6,000 participants from other schools as well to come in and participate against us in our facilities. Uh, we host approximately 75,000 spectators throughout the year in our facilities. Uh, we host approximately 1,500 athletic events in our facilities. And then we also ho host things that are not athletic, uh, such as ROTC and fine arts. And we have camps that take place and outside community usage. So our facilities do get a lot of usage and we get a lot of uh, bang for our buck in our facilities. Uh, as I go through this, you're gonna see some recurring themes about the facility recommendations. Uh, many of the facilities that I'm gonna discuss are gonna, they're gonna be at the end of their life cycle. Uh, they're becoming, are they either becoming or they are outdated and antiquated. Uh, of course, you always have wear and tear. Uh, some of the recommendations are due to cancellations and postponements of events that we have when we have uh, bad weather. Uh, we have some safety issues and concerns that, that maybe and calls us to think this would be a good recommendation. And then some of these are, are good, you know, for the program and for the spec, spectators, they're just enhancement for ALEAF ISD. Uh, so that, yeah, I think you're gonna see that throughout these uh, recommendations that we make. Next slide. Okay, priority one, uh, Crump Stadium turf replacement. We are at the end of the turf's life. It's uh, coming to 10 years old. Uh, at that point, the quality of the turf diminishes over time due to wear and tire and the weather 
and the sunlight, you know, just anything that's outside, you, you experience that in your own home of things on your patios and stuff that deteriorate. And when, the, when that stuff happens, the base begins to harden and it loses its elasticity and absorption. An estimated cost of this is about uh, 963522042 And so in the future here, I won't tell you the cost estimate. You'll be able to see that at the bottom. Uh, so just at each frame, uh, when we get to each priority, look at the bottom for the cost estimate. Next one, Craig. Okay, priority one. Another priority one is the Crump Stadium track resurface. Same thing as the turf on the field. Uh, it's at the end of its life. It's uh, 10 years old. The track is hardened over time and the surface begins to deteriorate. I think in this picture, if you look at the track, the track looks nice. But if you'll see that the red is bleeding over into the white of the lines, you know that's the that's the top of the uh, of the surface that's beginning to deteriorate and wear and tear. And when that happens, uh, you know you lose your traction. It becomes somewhat of a safety issue, especially like in the hurdle events uh, or if the if the track becomes wet, uh, you don't have the traction like you do when it's uh, when it's new. And then there's the cost estimate at the bottom. Next slide. Another priority one is our outdoor scoreboards. We have currently seven outdoor scoreboards that need to be replaced. They're, they're, they were with these scoreboards. What's happening is that we're at the end of a situation where uh, the parts are becoming obsolete, and we're having co constant uh, maintenance issues with them. And when they need repair, it, it, we just can't hardly find the parts anymore. So we have missing bulbs and. Uh, we have long delays just trying to get the parts. So th those scoreboards are at A. Lee Field, Hastings Baseball Field, Hastings Softball, Elsick Baseball, Taylor's High School Football Soccer Stadium, Taylor Softball, and Baseball Fields. The next one, another priority one are some uh, replacement of indoor gym scoreboards. Uh, we have currently 12 campuses that the scoreboards are in need of replacement. Same thing as the outdoor school boards. The technology is antiquated, it's outdated, it's at the end of its cycle, constant maintenance issues. We, we can no longer find the parts, they're not available. So uh, we, we, we're in dire need. Another priority one is to replace the school board at Crump Stadium with a video board. Uh, the school board at Crump Stadium, just like the other outdoor school boards, it's at the end of its life. The parts are becoming obsolete. It's constantly in need of repair. It's very delicate. If we have any type of weather, we usually have a situation with the school board going out. Uh, we would like to replace it with a new video board, which many of the school districts in the area are, are going to. What uh, When you do this, it enhances the experience at the athletic events, but it also helps with the fine arts events and the community events. Uh, it'll benefit the CT media, uh, CT media students. Uh, they'll have opportunities to uh, work towards scholarships because they'll get live broadcasting experience. Uh, there'll be internship opportunities, game day experience, uh, creation of marketing materials. Uh, there's revenue opportunities when you have the video boards. So I think it's a really a, a plus for ALEAF ISD. Replacing the school board with the, with the video board also provides the opportunity to promote ALEAF ISD as a school district, showcase the district initiatives, highlight students and district personnel, and recognize community heroes and organizations. Uh, it, you can provide district messaging and updates. It enhances all the special events. You can have graduation if needed, fine art events, community and district events. You can have movie night. There's, I mean, really what you can do with these scoreboards is endless. Uh, you know, of course, everybody, I think is probably aware of our annual a leave proud day that we had that we could utilize that video board as well to get information out to the community. Okay, another priority one is to re redesign and reconstruct the press box at Crump Stadium. Uh, as you see in the top photo there, uh, the press box was built in 1974. I was a fourth grader at Lake Waco Elementary playing kickball. So it's, it's moving fastly toward 50 years of age. And I think in the uh, previous graph that Ms. Rodriguez showed you, I think back when the population and enrollment was low, I think the scoreboard was great at that time in 1974. But now we, we have 6A programs and we have more coaches and we have more media coverage and the facility we have is really is not, it's not where it needs to be. It's currently not handicap accessible. Uh, it lacks space and functionality. 
Uh, it's small. It does not meet the needs of the coaches and the media. We have turned people away sometimes if they if they ask if they can have a room to broadcast. Uh, it, it's kind of first come, first serve. Uh, you know, I feel sorry for the coaches or anybody else that's trying to move event equipment up there. The mobility is, is, is very tough. That's a very steep walk up to that press box. Uh, we have visibility issues due to the outdated glass on the windows. So during games, we have condensation and we have to get a maintenance guy out there and he has to get a squeegee and squeegee the window so the coaches and the people that are working in the press box can see the game. And, and, and it's just because of the age of the, of the uh, press box. So I've taken some pictures of it. You can see there's a pretty tight walkway in space there. There's some another big concern. There's some major drop offs. Uh, if you're not paying attention, you could walk off into a, a, another level there, and you know it's it's kind of a concern. It's happened to, to our people in our office uh, several times. You forget that that drop off is there. Next slide, and then I took some pictures of a, a comparable stadium that was an older stadium like ours. You don't have to tear down the entire stadium, but you can come in and revamp and redesign the the, the uh, press box. You can see there's a major difference in the photos compared to what we have and what, what it could look like. Another priority one is the resurfacing of the tennis courts over by uh, on High Star between the uh, Elsick and Hastings field houses. Uh, you know, this is a safety issue. There are trip hazards out there, severe cracks on the court, there's holes on the court. Uh, the surface is really worn down, it, it becomes slippery. Uh, it requires con constant maintenance and patching and we get a lot of community use on these courts, so they, they really need to be taken care of. Uh, I think the pictures speak for themselves. Another priority one is the Hastings softball field dugout. Uh, as you can see, it's, uh, I think we got a lot of life out of it, and it's time to replace them. Uh, it's becoming a safety issue structurally. Uh, it's beginning to fail. Uh, and uh, so I, I think the pictures, once again, kind of speak for themselves. A uh, priority two is the redesign of the locker rooms in the stadium. Uh, as you can see, they're kind of outdated. Uh, there's currently no separate male or female dressing area for officials. Uh, if you watch the Super Bowl, there's a female official in the Super Bowl. We're seeing more and more officials, female officials in football. So we really need a separate dressing area for those females and separate them from the males. Uh, the showers and the restrooms, are really insufficient. As you can see, there's one potty there. Uh, there's a urinal on a potty, a toilet, and uh, you're talking about maybe 65 kids. And you know, who's going to battle over that? So we really, we really need to redesign that. And then uh, our training rooms under there as well are kind of insufficient. They they lack storage. And this is just uh, an example of what we could do. Nothing fancy, but something very practical. It's very efficient and effective, and you can um, allows a lot more seating for the participants. Uh, priority three would be to add synthetic turf to A Leaf Auxiliary Field and Taylor High School Field. A Leaf Auxiliary Field is the field across from Elsick High School, and then Taylor has a competition field on their campus. We have multiple uses on these facilities, and I took these pictures <coughs> here. And due to COVID, we probably had less events this year than we have had in the past on these on these grass fields. But as you can see, we really we get a lot of wear and tear, and it becomes a safety issue. And it's hard to keep enough grass on them by the end of the seasons to you know to, to maintain that we want to keep everybody safe. So I think with synthetic turf, we'd had a we'd have a reduction in maintenance. Uh, we'd have less cancellation of practices, you know, due to uh, rain. Main, rain's our main event in Houston. Uh, of course, it's, it's better for the environment too. We're saving water and they use a lot of recycled materials in, in, um, in building those uh, synthetic turfs. And then that will provide year round use for multiple teams and multiple school organizations. Uh, sometimes we have to tell people they can't get on it because it's either too wet or you know we can't tear it up because we have a game. Uh, another priority three would be to grade resurface existing softball and baseball fields that we have. Over time, you know, uh, the fields are going to have peaks and valleys and things are going to deteriorate. And so that becomes a safety concern. You have trip and fall hazards and you get bad bounces in baseball. 
And as an infielder, uh, if you've ever played baseball or softball, that's one thing you, you really don't want to get is a bad bounce. And uh, so we'd like to get rid of those peaks and valleys and the lips on the infield where the, the, the grass transitions to the infield. And then I think this will also help provide proper drainage for the, the irrigation of the field, which will also reduce in some cost of watering. So I appreciate the time that I was given. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Glenn, did you have oh, anything man. that you wanted to add to that? Great job, Scott. Thank you. No, other than, you know, like Scott said, so much of this isn't, it's it's end of life and it's uh we're wanting to 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 provide a better uh <clears throat> secure and safe environment for our student body as a whole for these facilities thanks glenn uh, we didn't introduce glenn to you he's our director of construction and facilities and glenn is also an architect so he's well qualified to uh make some of these recommendations as well. We're going to move straight into uh, our transportation needs. Richard Torres, our Director of Transportation, is going to be talking to you. And after we're through with transportation, we will move into our tips for a time. Richard? Hello, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well, and um, I hope everyone's safe. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and get the presentation started on our transportation. Um, for a quick overview, I just wanted to provide a quick synopsis, quick overview for those that may not be aware of our operation. Aidleaf ISD utilizes over 300 buses to transport students. Our, our buses travel over 3 million miles per year. Uh, we uh, approximately transport about 27,000 students each, uh, each day. Uh, the district services more than 250 routes daily, which consists or compiles into 1,200 runs per day. We also provide uh, transportation services for our charters, our field trips, our shuttles, and so forth. And, and so next slide, please. Uh, here's some items that I'm uh, recommending for transportation. I'm not going to go through every one of them, but I will leave a, a, a couple. Uh, I will, if we can leave that up, uh, Craig, for a little bit so that people can look at the uh, items. Uh, basically, items that we're going to address is end of life cycle, some facility enhancements, uh, also governing those are safety, and then some, uh, uh, some additional facilities as well. Okay, Craig. So our priority number one is, uh, if you look here at the chart, uh, this is a, um, a quick summary of what we're wanting to do for the next five years. So if you look at it, it's broken down by year. It is broken down by quantity. And so it just gives you a quick overview of some of the procurement uh, strategies that we want to do with procuring buses. Uh, a lot of our buses um, at present day, there's about 70 buses that are older in 15 years and they've really reached the end of their life cycle. Within the next couple of years, we'll have an additional 53 buses that'll hit that area. So what we, what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that we plan accordingly to, to ensure that we provide good, safe equipment, uh, not only to our drivers, but to our students. So uh, next slide, Craig. Another priority one is to upgrade our SmartTag tablet upgrade. Uh, SmartTag was a board safety initiative. Um, the actual tablet has reached, the current tablet that we have has reached the end of its uh, life cycle. So we're wanting to upgrade those. And once we upgrade those, we should be good to go for a, an additional five years. Richard, can you give a little, little history or uh, information on, on what a SmartTag tablet does? <laughs> Absolutely. Smart tag for us is a safety tool management system. Um, to, to provide a quick overview, it allows us to identify where our buses are at live at any given time. Um, we're also able to monitor the speed of a bus. Uh, so if there's an issue with a driver that is uh, speeding, uh, not stopping properly accordingly, our management is able to identify that. Most importantly, SmartTag allows us to, um, it, it allows to communicate to our drivers where students get on and students get off. 
Uh, kiddos, uh, what they do is when they get on the bus, they swipe a, a reader, which uh, tells the driver whether that kiddo is on the correct bus or not. And so it's a big, big safety tool for us. Uh, when used correctly, we could easily address uh, concerns from parents if, uh, or, or the school. If we want to, if there's a lost kiddo that uh, we can't find in the afternoon, if used correctly, we could look up smart tag and determine what time the kiddo got on the bus, what time the student got off and so forth. So it's a big safety tool. It, it does a, a myriad of other items. It does allow our drivers to do the pre-trip and post-trip on the tablet. Uh, the, it do, also allows them to submit maintenance issues on buses. So it has helped streamline a lot of our paper items that we normally did in the past by paper. But most importantly, it's a, it's a huge, huge safety tool for us. Uh, we use it every day. When we get calls from parents, we're better able to respond to parents and address safety issues immediately. Another priority, uh, one that we're wanting to recommend and get uh, moving quickly is our camera systems on our school buses. Uh, typically when you buy a school bus, that school bus is pretty good. It, that bus you can rely on for 15 years. But we gotta remember that when we put these camera systems on these buses, these camera si systems are, are residing in these buses. So when, when the weather gets to hundred degrees out there and when it gets very cold, these systems don't have the same longevity. They don't have the same life cycle as our buses do. Uh, you could buy a bus and you could, you know, the buses, like I said, are, are good for 15 years, but these systems, they're, they're not designed to last that long. And so one of the things that we're wanting to do is to put this item on a life cycle so that when we do get calls from parents or we get calls from the principal wanting assistance on, on a situation on the bus, we could adapt and get that information to the principal and so that we could address issues as they arise on the bus. Next slide, please. Another priority one that we're wanting to do, as Scott Mullig had mentioned, uh, our facility here at the Senate facility, um, his facility was built in the late 70s. So it's, it's, it's up there on age. Um, as you can tell on the, on the picture, um, this is an area that is a, a, our main, I guess, parking facility or area for buses that has deteriorated over time. It's, it's, a, it's a really a safety issue. In the past two years, we've had significant trips and falls with employees. Uh, and so we wanna be able to address these areas. If you go to the next slide, uh, I'll provide a, an, another quick overview of some other additional areas. Next slide, please. So if you look at this slide right here, um, you should see an area in the middle. And this is a, an area of course that has a lot of wear and tear. This is. This area supports all our buses when they en enter, exit, and when they park. And so it, it, I guess over, over the years, it's just, it's been an area that has been highly trafficked. And so uh, it, there's a lot of area in this, in, in that yellow area that has a lot of cracks and, and, and it's just has, I guess the concrete has eroded. And so we want to be able to address that to, to, to mitigate trips and falls. And like I said, it, it's, it, we want to implement and address that so that we can not only enhance the, the area, but mitigate you know, falls and trips and so forth. If you could go on to the next slide real quick. This is another area that's south of our shop that really has deteriorated as well. Um, it's really in need of, of, of replacement uh, enhancements and so forth. And this is, these are all at the Senate facility. If you go on to the next slide, please. This is also the Senate facility. This is north of our shop. This is another area that has gotten a lot of um, erosion with concrete and stuff. There's a lot of cracked uh, pieces of concrete in that area. And, and once again, it's just because it's, it's an old facility built in the 70s and it's just gotten a lot of traffic and it really needs to be updated. If you go to the next slide, these are areas at the ASF facility. For those that, that may not be aware, um, we, our transportation department has two facilities. Uh, the Senate facility houses uh, all the regular ed buses and then the ASF facility on Bel Air houses our sped ed smaller platform buses. And so what you're looking at now is you're looking at the ASF uh, facility on Bel Air that's also in need of concrete repair. 
Okay, this is another item that we're identifying as a priority one. Uh, the picture depicted in this slide is our oil pit, our maintenance pit, and this is what we use to change the oil and, and, and conduct preventive maintenance schedules on our buses and white fleet. So the, the issue that we're having here is that every time we get excessive rain or inclement weather, this area floods. And when it floods, of course, it hinders our ability to, to conduct preventive maintenances on our buses and so forth. We have to evacuate the water and get that water out of there before we can you know, conduct normal day-to-day -day preventive maintenance and um, initiatives. So this is an item that is uh, not only does it look bad, but it's a huge, huge safety issue that we, we need to get corrected. Okay, this is another priority one item. Uh, at present day, uh, the Senate facility uh, has uh, two tanks, two diesel tanks, uh, capacity is about 20,000 gallons. And at present day, these diesel tanks do not have a backup, uh, backup generator. So as, as, we, as we noticed last week when this winter is situation affected, we lost power. So we're wanting to, to add this uh, respective hardware in place. So that way, if we do uh, lose power due to a hurricane or to any type of um, weather related incident, we are able to fuel our buses or provide fuel to uh, emergency responders and so forth. A priority two, once again, as I mentioned, this facility is, <clears throat> is up there on age, built in the 1970s. Our school bus wash is, if, uh, when I looked at the records, it's over 25 years old. It's basically obsolete. The challenge that, you know, as Scott had mentioned, is one of the challenges is obtaining parts. Um, it's constantly breaking down. And then when we need to get parts, it's, it's really, really a struggle to, to, to actually acquire. And so this is a priority two that I wanna put in. And so it's important that I think that we portray a positive image. And I, and I think it's important that we have school buses running throughout our district, clean and washed and so forth. So this is an item that I, I think we need to put in. Uh, a priority two that I would like to facilitate as well is our tool storage at each facility. Um, our, our current shops are outdated and antiquated, obsolete. They don't have the respective infrastructure in, in, in the shops to properly house uh, technician tools and so forth. And so we're looking at adding and incorporating this and hopefully it'll make us a little bit more effective and efficient and it'll also allow for a better layout of each facility. And then uh, some other uh, priority two item that we're wanting to also upgrade is the ASF transportation facility. Uh, for those that may not be aware when that property was purchased, I believe it was a lumber uh, business. And so uh, when we acquired that, uh, there was an area that was reserved for the shop. And so that whole area really lacks uh, in functionality from a shop perspective. It, at current day or present day, it has no appropriate insulation. So when it gets really hot, or when it gets really cold, it's very uncomfortable for those technicians to be working on buses. And there's some foundation issues also there present that also hinders that, uh, our ability to, to take advantage of that area. And there's some plumbing work that also needs to be done. So this is a priority too that I'd really like to get done to enhance that area. And also by doing that, I believe we can in increase our effectiveness and efficiency in the shop. And I believe that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Richard. I know that you're probably getting tired of sitting there and not being able to ask questions. So we're going to uh, help you do that right now by directing you into your work groups, uh, your Zoom breakout rooms. You're gonna have, as I've mentioned, a district work group facilitator who's gonna help you in your conversation, but that person is neutral to the content. So he or she she will, uh, and I'm quoting uh, Craig Acorn, he said, encourage dialogue without influencing your discussions or decisions. And at the end of the time, I'm gonna uh, lengthen the time a little bit because we're doing so well on our time. Uh, I'm gonna give you 20 minutes of discussion time. And you're at the end of probably, we'll clue you maybe about uh, five minutes before time's up. And we want you to submit one question from your group. There are nine groups of you. 
So submit one question or comment uh, and that will be answered publicly. And any additional questions will be submitted uh, by the, there's a scribe in there too, he's going to be writing down the questions that are not answered publicly. And we're gonna put those on the FAQ page on the bond steering committee tab on the ALEAF uh, website. So Kimberly, would you go on and, and put everybody in their groups right now? I'm going to visit your group, so don't pay any attention if I pop in there. Okay, one thing I wanna say real quick, if you don't automatically go to a room, it's because some of you have not logged in from the email account that we have for you. We will do our best to get you assigned, so it may take a minute. Okay, for those of you who are still in this room area, I'm going to ask you a question. If you are phone number 832-574-3602, will you please tell me your name? Craig and Hilda, while I'm doing this, the ones that have names, if y'all start, a, we'll start assigning them. Got it. Phone number I've yet to have a breakout room pop up. I'm in the same uh, situation. Uh, this is Richard. Y'all, guys, if you are one of the speakers, you are not going to a breakout room. Oh, okay. Only committee members right now. You're in the cool room. Hold on. 10 4. I'm a facilitator and I'm not even in the room. I'm, uh, we're working on it. We're working okay. on it. I'm not sure why y'all didn't go. I'm just hanging out. That's good. So I'm going to leave you in the cool group, okay? Y'all have a good evening. <laughs> I got to go get on this drive in. Catch you later. Thanks for coming. Sure, it was fun. Thanks, Michelle. You did an outstanding job. I took great notes on your portion. <laughs> bye bye.
Okay, I'm going to ask if there is anybody that is still in, has not been sent to a room, who is not part of Huckabee and not part of ALEAF ISD, will you please speak up? I think that's it, Kim. Whew. Okay, I'm looking through the names. It looks like it's all of us and the directors and... Kim, this is Andy. I'm not a facilitator. Oh, okay. <laughs> Who is this? Andy. Oh, Andy. That's right. Okay. I, I found before. you. Just a second, Andy, and I'll get you there. Day before? I got him. Okay. I just sent him. All right. Okay. And Michelle wants to go. <clears throat> She wants to go into two. Did someone send Michelle? I sent her. Good job, thank you. Do we need to pull her back? No, she can come back. Okay. She can come. She can come back on her own, and then when she comes back, she can tell us just to go somewhere. It's challenging when you can't walk around the room and kind of hear what. <laughs> I know. It is. T table nine is really uh, thin tonight. You want to send somebody else over there? Craig? Yes. Hey, Craig, can you go make um, Pam Lowe a co-host? Because she yes. wants to share the questions on her screen. Okay, can you help uh, to... room nine then while I'm doing... Uh... What's group nine's problem? There's just three people in it. Yeah. They may be absent. Yeah. Because they just may be... They just may be absent. And Pam Lowe's on this? I don't see her name. Yes, she's a facilitator. Does anybody want to go to room? What is it? Nine? Room nine, can somebody? Does anybody want to go in there and visit? Hey, Leaf. I can if you need me to, since I'm not in a room. All right, Kathy. Michelle wants another room. She needs to come out, doesn't she? Does she has to come out? <laughs> I took her out. Okay. Uh, Oh, where's my participant list? Uh-huh. See, that's what's happening to you. Old age is setting in. No, I just hit the wrong button. Dead gummit. We're doing good on time, guys. All right. We have somebody named Jody coming in. Um, Mar um Craig, make Marla a co-host. Finally. Is she already in a room? Yeah, um, yes. She yes. is a group lead. She's a leader in number she's in four. Number four. Yeah. Okay. How do I make her a co-host on the fly? I don't know. On the I think you go to her picture. It's not letting you up on the right click. Jody, let me see. You can You just. You just joined our meeting. Can you tell me what your last name is? Unmute. No. 
Jody. Hold on. I'm sorry. Okay. That's okay. I want to make sure you get into one of the breakout rooms. And can you um, hear me? Can so you hear me? To, I can hear you. Yes. Okay, ma perfect. That's what I, I need to know. My last name is Esteembo. It's Mary Esteembo. I go by Jody. Okay, so it's Mary Esteembo. I'm going to send you to group one because that's your assignment. Okay. All right, perfect. And Mary, thanks for coming on. It's good to see you. This is Craig. Yeah, I was I was on a on a phone call. I, I listened to the whole call, the whole meeting, but somehow I got disconnected, and I just I decided to go ahead and see if my laptop would work. Well, we appreciate you making the effort to come back. So, your Jody it should have sent you to a room, and you didn't. There you go. Yay. Okay. I can only make ready to come out. I can only make people who are not in breakout <laughs> rooms co-hosts and all that other stuff. Okay, well, we'll next time I need to remember to do it at the very beginning of the meeting, like while we're doing a welcome. So we'll get yeah. that in our debrief notes. Yeah, two weeks from tonight is our next one. So, because if I make them a co-host in the very beginning, if you make them a co-host like you did for Hilda and I, then they 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 don't need to be a co-host the whole time. Did somebody go help Adam in, in nine? He's got people there. Okay. Or is he texting you? Let me call him. Is back. he texting saying he needs it? Good evening, everyone. This is Katina Gordon. I haven't been assigned, so I didn't know if I got to hang out with you all or I needed to be assigned. No. You, no, you're not. You, you, you were not told you are a, you have a job, but in the future, I'm going to put you down as an alternate for being a scribe because we're constantly looking for people who can go help, but we filled them all today. All right, but sounds thank you. good, thank you. Great job on the presentations, guys. So if we pop into a room, we can pop ourselves back out or I have to have you pop me back out? Yes. No, you can pop back out. So no. might as well just no. get, you know, invest in a, in a new platform definitely. Yeah. What's up, Craig? We had an all A-Leaf group. None of our, our folks were here from the uh, community. Well, hello. What a group this is. I mean, this, this is, is a group. Really uh, A-Leaf a -Leaf proud group. Oh my gosh, this is the winner circle. However, um, Craig, I don't know who um, is keeping track of the attendance. I did hear Michelle say that if people weren't here, then, you know, a certain amount of time. Sorry, my husband's yelling at the TV. Um, that is correct. Uh, we're going to give you three absences. And we, we have 80 people on this call. We had four or five tell me today they couldn't make it for other commitments and home repairs and stuff. We all have, we've all got, yeah. I've got busted well, pipes. Everybody has busted pipes. Like so. I said, uh, Marva Watson, her husband passed away and his funeral was just Sunday. So that may be why she's not on today, but she, I mean, was a long time A-Leaf employee and her family, her daughters are, are uh, teachers and are educators in the district. And so I'm, I'm sure that she will come back. It's just probably a little bit early for her to join this. Right. She, she was solid in 2015. I, you're right. Yes. Kathy, I bet she comes. I just, back. I would, I would hate to see her get knocked off um, right now. Well, Michelle, we are caring people, so we're not going to kick anybody off who is a, such a good community member. So y'all doing okay? Oh, I, I know Kathy's got a busy weekend. I, I do have a busy weekend. <laughs> Yeah. I, my, my new side hustle will be personalized hand sanitizers because that's what I was working on <laughs> before this meeting started. <laughs> my daughter's okay. getting married uh, this weekend. So. Hey, congratulations. Awesome. Yeah. We were a little bit fearful last weekend <laughs> if this was going to happen. So. Uh, all, good. all right, guys, I'm going to pop in on some other rooms and see what they're doing. Thank you all for. Okay. Bye, Craig. 
Y'all cannot get on Wi-Fi. Is there any way I can... Are you using this computer right now? I'm using all of this right now. I need it. Okay. And being our spokesperson and just ask that question because I think what they're going to do is come around to each group and say, what is your question? What do you have? And that is a good question. Why do we, if, it, if we need it when there is inclement weather and we're not in school, if that's why you need it, then, you know, how is it going to, what buses are going to be running? Right. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. And we can continue on until she pulls us out of here. I just wanted to make sure that you know how that goes. You right. get pulled out and you didn't get a chance to really finish. Yeah. <laughs> they but did mention one reason they needed the backup generators was because they would share that with first responders. He did say that. Yeah. And so they don't that's change. what we were waiting for. They don't change when they're 30 either. Yeah, I've got a 24 year old and I, I could I can feel it. So yeah, so we, it just it just gave us all, you know, validation that we all, we all go through the same stuff. <laughs> Kimberly, how do we make an announcement so all can hear that there's five minutes left? I am sending it so it pops up on everybody's screen. Okay. If you're Thank in you. a room. And I'm getting ready to send. I've got a minute. In a minute, I'm sending a one minute warning. Okay. About a five minute and a one minute. I've, I've popped in three or four rooms and there's some good discussion going on. Good. for advertising and sponsorship, can those funds somehow be connected to the cost of this uh, scoreboard? Is that, is, that, is that something that will offset the cost? That's a very good question. So our, our next question is, um, is there anything on that list that you feel isn't prioritized correctly? So as, as we kind of went through, or as the directors kind of went through, they indicated whether it was a priority one or a priority two issue. And I, I believe the priority one issues um, were basically a, a must happen. You know, they really think it needs to happen due to safety concerns and things like that. Um, so was there anything that you felt wasn't prioritized correctly? Um, the press box, was it, wasn't that a pr priority one? Um, yes, actually, Barbara, it was. I'm sorry, Shannon, I'm gonna jump in. Barbara, it is a priority one. Yeah. It's actually a priority two on the list. Uh, we uh, changed that uh, this afternoon about 4.30. It is a priority okay. one. Okay. Sorry, Shannon, I'm not trying to That's cut okay. you off. That's all right. I'm, I'm glad you're here, Craig. Oh, here. If, if I were in charge, I'd put it a priority too. That's my, my opinion, my two cents for it. Well, that, that's good because we're going to have these discussions. Well, you, the committee, are going to get down to the nitty gritty like we did last time, Barbara. Just okay, because so we put it as a one or two now, you can certainly change that. If you go through this and find the need, we still got another presentation tonight and several Craig, more in two weeks. Craig, can I interrupt? We need to go come ahead. up with our burning question go ahead. for the group and we only have 20 seconds left. So I'm I sorry. Don't know, um, I think it's be between the uh, cost estimate. Where do they get that number from? I heard a lot of good discussion. Great discussions. Yeah. And good questions from the, the group. I was really pleased to hear that. This is working way better than I thought it would. <laughs> That's why we so practiced. I, I, I texted someone. I missed the peep. I've been seeing you. But honestly, I did a, a big group with masks on uh, in another district. It was an in-person meeting. I didn't like that at all. All I could see were eyes and I couldn't see their the faces. And this is really better than that. Uh, although I'd love to see you in person as well. Are all the groups back now, Kim? 
They should be. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now we're going to uh, take those questions. Uh, where do I see them, Kim, the questions? Or is someone? You're going to call on a group, a table number. Okay. 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 You're going to call upon a table number and then they will be asking you. Okay. Let's uh, let's make it easy on ourselves and talk and start with uh, Daryl's group in room one. Y'all were a great group. I loved listening to you. Uh, so, who in Daryl's group is going to ask that question? Uh, they nominated me, Isaac. Isaac. Hey, yeah. Isaac. Yeah, you had some great questions. Let's hear it. Yeah, no, the whole the whole time. I don't think we had enough time to really discuss everything oh, uh, thoroughly on. because we had some. <laughs> We have some really good stuff, but I think one that, that really came out for us uh, is important because we, we definitely had parents of, of athletes and, and former athletes in, in our group. And it was important to consider the safety and the priorities of, of the track uh, um, regarding uh, replacing um, and, and uh, the track, the turf uh, and stuff like that. And, and and really uh, take into that consideration another part of that. How did we come up with the prior? How, how did we cut, come up with the priorities of those uh, um, of those uh, issues in in uh, in in the track in the sports? Okay, uh, Scott is Scott with us. You want to answer that or Glenn? Yeah. So yeah. So those the ones that are priority ones is <clears throat> they just they have to be done. Uh, we're at the point where I think we we've, we've squeezed about as much life as we can. I think if we uh, if we go much longer on them, you'll start seeing the increase of lower limb injuries uh, with the running surfaces as far as the turf and the uh, and the tracks. Uh, you lose traction, and of course, could we play on them? Yeah, you can play on them, but I, I would feel very uncomfortable. I don't know if I'd want my child playing as much as you have to change direction and, and football. And then if you're running the hurdles on a wet track, uh, I just think it's, you know, they're, they're at the end of their life and we're, we're starting to see some cracks. And when the water gets underneath the uh, track, then that just compounds the issue. So they still look nice. We take a very good care of them, uh, but uh, you know, they, they need to be replaced. Okay, so Isaac, did that answer your question? I think it did. I think I hope it did for the rest of the team. Uh, it did answer and, and let fill me in on, you know, what what we felt or what the um, sports director felt um, was that wear and tear and how how that could affect the safety of 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 athletes playing on there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That was a great question. Let's move quickly to room two. That would be Sean's uh, group, and who's going to speak up for group two? This is Julie. I am said for Sean tonight, but Anna is going to represent our group. Okay, good. Thanks, Anna. Hi. Uh, okay, so our question was actually for transportation. Uh, and so my question is, uh, we, we were talking about transportation. We actually don't even know where to start uh, as far as talking about transportation because it all seemed important. So uh, do we talk about uh, bus maintenance, uh, you know, facility maintenance, uh, you know, cracks in the uh, concrete seem important. Uh, so as we started talking about it, we really don't even know where to start. Like, what do you suggest on uh, how to even start talking about what to consider an actual priority and how we start talking about uh, where to start? Because AC is important, heat is important on the buses, but, you know, so is maintenance on the buses. Um, uh, keeping, uh, you know, the uh, maintenance workers is important. So uh, you as the facility manager, what should, what would you recommend that uh, we, uh, who, you know, are managing, um, you know, helping you manage the money or getting the money for, for this project? Can you help well, us figure out how to, yeah, help us here? Absolutely, absolutely. If you think about what Scott had mentioned about his athletics, you have to re realize that if we don't have buses and we don't have adequate and good buses, we can't pick up our kids at home and take them to school. And then none of the items can happen. You can't have field trips. You can't have kids attending, you know, uh, games at other campuses and so forth. So 
Uh, a big priority number one for me is 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 acquiring the respective buses, and it and it's going to stem into another area. Um, we got to realize that these buses they travel uh, they travel, and we put up millions of miles on them per year, um, and so many districts have incorporated a 15 year school bus replacement program. So what we're focusing on on this bond is we wanna make sure that we try to replace those buses once they hit a 15 year milestone. Once a bus hits 15 years, there you, you, you encounter a lot of issues. You encounter, you're buying more parts. Okay. Um, they're not as efficient as, as a brand new bus. So your gas mileage and gas efficiencies go down. And so it, it costs the district more to keep that bus. And so it's very important for me that we have was we have respective buses, good buses in place, and then we replace them as and we put them on a cycle as well. Another very important aspect with, with getting good quality buses is that um, for those that may not be aware, we are competing, we're in the market and we are competing with other uh, companies such as UPS and Amazon and, and WCA Waste. And so I, I want to make sure that we have good quality vehicles out there. So then when it comes to recruiting and retaining drivers, CDL drivers, I want to make sure that we have good quality vehicles out there. We have lost a, a, we have lost a large number of drivers because they're going to other markets. They're going to other companies that not only pay well, but they have air conditioned vehicles. There is a large, mm -hmm. a large portion of our fleet that, that is not air conditioned. And so if you imagine, we wouldn't drive our own vehicles in the summer without AC. So mm -hmm. it's important. It's in very important that we incorporate a good school bus replacement program. It's important that we have good quality, safe vehicles out there so that they're safe, that they're efficient, and that our students are able to take advantage of that. And so having good quality buses not only is important from a safety perspective, but it's also important for recruitment, for retainment. To, so that we can keep quality drivers and that we could keep our maintenance costs down as well. Thanks, Richard. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> I'm yeah. going to I, I don't want to miss any uh, group. So I'm going to ask you that you keep your questions succinct like Ava did and keep your answers as uh, as brief as we can too, because we want to make sure everybody has a chance. OK, let's go to uh, room three. Um, Shannon, was that you? And who's going to be the spokesperson for room three? So Aaron is going to be our spokesperson. Yes. Yeah, so uh, just real quick, I, I wish we did have more time. We didn't get a chance to, to hit every single point we wanted to hit and the detail we wanted to hit. But I think the most burning question we had was um, the, the cost estimates next to all these projects. We were just wondering uh, where that came from, if it was a result of a bidding process, if those numbers came from contractors, or if it was just more of a general estimate? I'll answer that question. The, the estimation was done by our uh, architects that work with the district currently, and they use uh, various uh, tools and techniques to provide the uh, rough estimate pricing uh, no bids have been done at this time or anything like that. We're just using historical information, current market data information as far as what costs are. And we've also built in escalation factors into that as well, too. That was a good question, Aaron. Uh, <clears throat> the architects that the district selects are also vetted in... Uh, selected through a, a process by the Board of Trustees. And so all of them are experienced in, in K-12 uh, construction and, and issues. And so they, they give good faith estimates and they also call in the uh, general contractors uh, nationwide and locally to uh, bolster the data that they use to give estimates. Michelle, okay. can I can I throw into that this trail? Oh yes. Um, you know, at the end of this process, once the the committee comes up with a list of of uh, what's going to be in the bond, the, the recommendation to the board, you know, we're going to have to cost factor that out over the number of years that it takes, and whatever projects 
are going to be out there in year four and five and six are going to have to have inflation built into them. Yeah. But um, you may want to get get mired up into what comprised that particular amount that you see on one of these estimates. And, and I just kind of ask you not to get into that detail yet. We'll do that towards the end, evaluate it based on what was discussed as what the item is and what the need is. And if that need is really there, then we can value engineer the price and what, what all it entails uh, as we get closer to the end. And if I could just add one other thing, before we actually make any of the purchases, after all these projects are authorized, they will go through a formal bid process um, before we award contracts and proceed with the, with the projects. Okay, let's move to uh, room number four. Uh, and that, that's Marla's room. And who's speaking for your group, Marla? Mr. Velasquez is going to be speaking for group four. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is for both the transportation and athletics. And is it, uh, why are the redesign of locker room stadium and the uh, ASF transportation facility a priority two and not a one, given their importance and need? Well, you wanna go first, Todd, or you want me to address that? Um, address <clears throat> go ahead, go ahead, Richard. Wait just a minute. Was that two questions or one question? I, yeah, I guess it was two, one for each. Okay, I think we're going to hold you to one question. That was so easy. <laughs> Good try. Leave this it to Andy. This is my first the rodeo, y'all. Don't try to get back me on that. Good try. Okay, had, let's have that, it had, Mr. It had, one it had one question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, pick one, Mr. Velasquez. <laughs> Did you want athletics oh, on that? Uh, athletics, athletics. Okay. Scott, did you hear the question? Unmute yourself, please. I'm trying to, it was not letting me unmute. Uh, so the reason it wasn't a priority one is, that, you know, we, we have to do the tracks and the fields. They are at the end of their life. At the end of the day, uh, the locker room should be done. So it's not a must, it's more of a should. Uh, so it's, you know, I think there's a bigger safety issue with those priority ones. And where if, 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 if you know, if we don't do the locker rooms, we're still gonna be able to get the kids in there and we're still gonna be able to compete and play the games. And I want to remind the committee also that the priorities that are assigned are assigned by the district based on their good faith uh, uh, evaluation of these things. But the committee has the prerogative to change those priorities and to select priorities twos over priority ones when we get to that decision making. So these are the district's priorities, perhaps not necessarily the committee's priorities. Okay, let's move to, uh, to room five, and that's Jennifer's uh, group, and who's going to ask that question? I'm going to be asking it for group five. Thank um, you. Tell me your name. I don't um, uh, Courtney? Yes. Okay. So it's, we had to, like Andy, but we'll just go with... Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with... Um, let me go with athletics, because we did notice that the video board was in priority one, but the... Um, facility and the stadium where they are at the, the pit was part two, um, two. Do those two not go hand in hand together if you're going to be running the video board as far as technology needs and requirements? And are you all, how did y'all prioritize those into two different levels? Okay, with the, uh, if we're, you know, we need to, we have to replace the school board. And if we want to stay with what what's everybody in the area is doing and stay competitive and and uh, provide the opportunities that we can showcase a leave. Uh, that's why that video board is a priority one. I mean, if, if we're gonna do it, this is the time to do it. Uh, you could do so many things with it besides just being a school board. Like I said before, you can have uh, announcements on it. You can showcase kids, uh, other departments can use it. You have movie night, uh, you can do revenue. Uh, you know, you can sell ads and sponsorships. And uh, so, I. I I just think if we're going to replace it, we need to replace it with the video board. 
And just will it function without the board was what was the other thing you referring to? Will that video board function without the priority to the replacing the, the booth and all the technology that goes along with it? Guys, I'm gonna have to ask you not to do a follow-up question because we're only on uh, room six and, and I'm almost out of time. So I'm just gonna hold that follow-up question and post it to the frequently asked questions. Okay, let's go to number six, uh, room number six, and that's Pam's group who's uh, asking the question. Dr. Hansen from group six will be asking the question. Okay, Dr. Hansen. Okay, uh, I guess this is a more general question than the, some of the ones that have been asked, uh, which is, uh, the $17 million figure uh, is part uh, uh, for the renovations to the broadcast uh, booths. That seems like a high number. And I, I was saying I thought it would be really helpful if we could have a more detail and insight into how we got to that large a number for that uh, specific aspect of the stadium renovations. Okay, uh, Scott. I was going to see if maybe Steve or Glenn could help us out with the pricing of that, because I'm sure it's, a lot of that pricing is also including the uh, elevator. Uh, Glenn or somebody want to talk about how the pricing was received? Or the cost? Yeah, I can. The, the 17 million has uh, an inflationary number to it as well but it also includes it's a it was modeled after a one recently uh completed in the alvin area that is very similar to uh what we would have there it's a standalone uh tower that would not attach to crump stadium on itself so it would have the elevator it would have the space to provide uh, adequate for coaching and for the media and everybody up in that uh, space. Glenn, what about the ADA requirements? Well, it would also, it would, it, with the elevator, it would allow for that access for the ADA uh, uh, handicap to get access to that level as well too. So uh, it's a, you know, it's a good number. It's a, it's a, you know, it's not been inflated to where, you know, it's nothing elaborate by any stretch of the imagination. It's not a, a uh, you know, and, and you also, uh, Dr. Hansen, it's, it's, uh, it has, you know, this, the square footage and it has the, the look of the, the uh, recent renovation to Crump too with the aluminum cladding and stuff. So in a, is what we have envisioned as well. Okay, y'all, I really am running very short of time. So let's move quick. Did I do, uh, was that room seven? No, we haven't done room seven. Would okay, you like let's do seven real quickly. Okay, Aliyah Malik is going to respond for group seven. Okay, my question is for the transportation department. Um, you all discussed um, having a backup generator for times when we have inclement weather for the diesel pumps for the buses, but we weren't in school last week during the winter storm since that was used as a reference. So I'm trying to understand why we would need to allocate funds to have a backup generator when we have weather that is that bad. We're not using the school buses. No one's at school. That's a very good question. Um, we we've had and we have an experience in the past when hurricanes hit and there's no power sometimes school districts or sometimes municipalities will ask school districts to utilize buses to evacuate people and sometimes emergency responders like we did this past week we had um, some fire stations local fire stations that had to utilize our gas because they had to respond to emergencies and there was no power to gas stations so 
Um, the backup generator would facilitate that. So in the event of a hurricane and we needed to evacuate people from an area or from let's say an area or from a city to another place, then we would need to have some type of, we would, not, we would need to have power to those, emerge, you know, to those diesel pumps and so forth. So I think it's very vital that we have some type of contingency plan in place in the event that there is power loss, we can, uh, we, we will have that functionality to, to fuel buses in the event that municipalities or maybe the city of Houston may, may contact HD and said, hey, I may need 40 buses to evacuate, you know, people from this area, or we may have emergency responders need to have access to that fuel so they can, you know, help other people in need. Thank you, Richard. Okay, I think I skipped a table, a room six. Did I skip six? No, you did not. Okay, perfect. Okay, room eight, and that's um, Nikki, that's your group. I'm not going to do room nine because I think it was all ALEAF people. Is that correct? That's okay. correct. Okay, then I'm just going to do eight. Who's speaking for you all? Um, for group A, Lynette has graciously accepted <laughs> the task of, of saying, um, giving our question. Thanks. Hi, guys. Um, we are in all favor of athletics and the things that they presented of great need. So I'm going to ask, we had two questions, but I'm going to move to the question with transportation. And it's really centered around the smart tags. Um, that's relatively new in our district. And so the, the question is, those, as far as, I don't have exact dates, but I think it's two, three years old that we've been doing smart tags. And so I think that was a priority one and, and that it's reached the end of life. So the question is, and, and spending 300,000 or I think it was on those, um, how sustainable is that? And, and the upgrade, is it gonna give us more uh, value on the use or, or moving That's forward? That's a good question on that. What we encountered with that uh, end of life cycle was that the manufacturer, uh, what they did, and, and Wally could jump in here because Wally and I talked a little bit about this, but the manufacturer created uh, an update, a critical update. And when they created that update, it, uh, that first generation tablet, it created functionality issues. And so, um, and so with that in mind, uh, SmartTag is trying our, their best to, to, to best support us when we encounter issues, but yeah, that, that update that the, that the manufacturer did, it was a critical update and it affected a good portion of the first generation tablets. Uh, and so that's why we're having to migrate and wanting to upgrade. Now, from an upgrade perspective, I think you had said, um, are we getting our, you know, our bang for our buck with SmartTag? For us, it's super, super important. We get a lot of calls from parents, uh, from the general public about buses speeding or buses not being at a respective location. Um, and so for us, it's a huge, huge safety tool. Uh, it, it better allows each supervisor to manage his, his or her drivers. And, and it allows us to address our customers' concerns on, 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 a, on a daily basis instead of having to waste time. Before we had SmartTab, we were really kind of going in circles trying to get back to our customers, parents and schools and so forth. So for us, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it is a huge, huge tool that allows us to better manage this facility. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I, okay, now we need to hear one more presentation on uh, safety and security. Uh, Chief Dan Turner, Chief of Police. Uh, Chief Turner, are you ready to go? Uh, yes, ma'am, I am. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Dan Turner. I'm Chief of Police for Aleph ISD. Uh, Craig, can you flip it, please? Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, my deployment, the expanded needs that we have. Uh, this deployment was uh, created or built back in 1990. And during that time, the deployment housed approximately 15 total employees. Uh, to date now, we have over 56 employees that's assigned to this police department. And we have expanded uh, 
our areas to its limits. We have nowhere to go. Uh, parking is non-existent basically because we share an area with uh, MIS and I need to have a space so that uh, we can have a training room. Uh, we need to be able to park vehicles. We need to be able to uh, adhere to the policies and procedures that's placed up on me as the chief of police as far as uh, criminal justice realities that we have to deal with in the police department, uh, sight and sound between juveniles and adults. And the state uh, creates policies for us to follow along with Harris County DA. So in order to do that, I have to have space to continue to grow so I can meet these mandates. Uh, next one, please. Uh, with that, uh, I have a fleet of uh, patrol vehicles. And uh, as you can see, some of my vehicles are, are really uh, antiques, but I have safe vehicles that we're using now. I need to be on a replacement cycle so that when a vehicle become unsafe as a police car, I'm able to remove that car from service and be allowed to uh, replace that vehicle. Uh, the cost of police vehicles are different from just purchasing a regular vehicle. I have to purchase a, a police equipped vehicle that meets the standards for police vehicles. And once you purchase that vehicle for anywhere between thirty and $35,000, then there's still $7,500 of uh, police equipment that have to be placed inside of that patrol car. I don't share cars. Uh, you get a lot more mileage from a car if only one officer drives that vehicle. So we're not sharing cars so I can get good use out of police vehicles for seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years. Next slide, please. Uh, another mandate that was placed upon us by the state of Texas is that all police departments will be required to communicate with surrounding police departments. And uh, that caused us to have to move off of the radio system that ALEAF provides. And we had to do a join the public safety uh, radio system through the city of Houston so that we can communicate with the fire departments, uh, constables, uh, other state agencies, HPD and others. Uh, these radios aren't expensive. These are the portable radios and uh, these radios are about $4,000 a piece. And the radios that go inside of the patrol cars are about $6,500 a piece. So this is a officer safe line that we need and we need to have uh, good working equipment. Next, please. Uh, in order to be transparent, we all know that uh, there's cameras everywhere. Uh, I, have caught, I have officers on campuses, I have patrol officers, I have gang officer, I have canine officers. And what I would like to do is take our transparency one step further by providing my officers with body-worn cameras. Uh, the technology is great with this. Uh, it's, it's, it's another means of holding everybody to acceptable standards and uh, being able to work well with our student staff and the public. Correct, uh, is it that? Glenn, do you want to discuss this or is this only Hilda? Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself, Dan. Yeah, the other uh, item that has come up is uh, it's a priority to it's replace chain link fencing with uh, wrought iron fencing around, like, for instance, Crump Stadium and uh, transportation is another facility that we're looking at doing it at. And, it, and what it, it will enhance the beautification of that along with providing additional security at both facilities because uh, we've experienced an increase in theft, vandalism at uh, both facilities. And uh, this will definitely help 
uh, deter from that. It'll provide more of a sound secure uh, insulation for those facilities. Next slide. And again, it's, it's a safety and security, like I mentioned before, mitigate theft uh, with district vehicles, uh, especially at the transportation department. Uh, Richard's constantly, you know, when, when the economic uh, situation gets to a certain point, we've experienced where they come in and steal catalytic converters off of our vehicles. And that's uh, about $2,000 a pop uh, when that happens. So it can add up very quickly. Um, so uh, next thing is to, for priority two is security cameras. Add uh, security throughout each of the transportation facility protect against assets. Uh, you know, currently we have security cameras there, but they're more like on the perimeter of the building. They don't really uh, provide the additional um, security like in the shop areas, uh, the district vehicles, the school buses and white fleet. We've got some in the school buses, but we need to enhance that uh, better than what we currently have. We need to monitor and uh, the entry and exit points of the parking areas. The existing infrastructure uh, already in place, you know, like the current light poles, we, when we change those out, we prep those four cameras so we can at least, uh, you know, the, the, we don't have to bear that additional expense of changing out light standards and stuff like that. We, we made that accommodation to accept uh, cameras in the event that we uh, add additional. Next slide. Uh, priority one is uh, securing our open cafeterias. We have uh, open cafeterias that do not have uh, entry doors. There's eight campuses currently that uh, in the last uh, safety uh, uh, exercise that we did district-wide, we identified. And those are at Albright, Mahaney, Chambers, Martin, Smith, Holub, Ali, and Elsick. And what it would be is you can, these are just a couple of quick photos to show the openness of that. And it would provide uh, a fourth layer of security at our campuses where we have the potential for large gatherings of students. And you can see here what I've done here is on this uh, layout, it kind of shows you the area of securing the open cafeterias in addition to in the next slide, it'll, it'll mention about the cross corridor areas as well. And uh, another priority one is securing our open libraries. We have 14 campuses that uh, the libraries are currently open. And this is another area that we have the potential for uh, large uh, gatherings of students at various times in the event of a, of a uh, need of a lockdown or secure, we've got small areas within no space to provide it, but nothing really within the library would add an, an additional layer of security. The three photos to the left show an open library uh, structure. The two on the right kind of give you an idea of how we would, we would uh, achieve that level of security. And it wouldn't necessarily be a wall. It could be a glass wall with a couple of doors that are controlled by access control. So in the event of a needed of a lockdown, they could be locked down to prevent somebody intruding into that space. And this is a priority two of securing the entrances. Uh, it's an across what we would call a cross corridor wall where a door and a wall would be uh, installed to create a closure to an area in the event that we had a, a, an individual that was trying to gain access to an area that we didn't want them into. It's a, it's, it's a more cost-effective way of, of allowing a, four layer, a fourth layer of security within our facilities where we have that uh, occurrence at. And this is one example, for instance, at Hollow Middle School, where it's the stairwells that go up to the second uh, floor, 
we could easily put a a, uh, a wall there that with doors that during you know that would provide a passing period exchanges and stuff like that but in the event that they needed to go into a lockdown those doors would lock and you can only exit through the through those doors you cannot gain entry into the door and that's what i've highlighted here with the balloons around uh, showing that and then also at the library areas as well just as an example of how that school would be uh, secured. Here is our priority one securing entrances into our cafeteria areas. This was at Mahaney and also at the cross corridors at Mahaney. Currently at Mahaney with that area that's not protected, you can see in this uh, floor plan, whereas Aleaf has gone to, you know, several versions of security enhancements back in, I think it was 2012, maybe 2013 period is where we added the double doors at the hallways to create a, a uh, safe passageway back into the open concept classrooms to stop that. One area that we need to also to provide a secure spot is at the uh, cafeteria area. And at the library at the opposite end, in addition, adding a cross corridor that leads out into the kinder area. Next slide. Craig. Hello. And I think that was the last slide. Uh, the okay. I believe there was one. Uh, did you do the entrances? Uh, there we go. There. That, no. The, the next one. entry. The next one. There. there we go. That was the last slide. This one is you. Okay. Because on my okay. I don't know if it's uh, bad, my internet's getting weak or not, but it's kind of stuck on the uh, priority one security entrances. We can, if if we have to uh, catch that up, we can do that at our next meeting. Oh, wait a minute, I, it just did, it just, yeah. that's the uh, video entrances to provide the, uh, in the event of like, especially in the summertime where we have reduced staff on campuses, and during a lockdown, especially like in this COVID area that we're currently in, and once we progress out of that area, we've currently, we've got it installed at a limited number of campuses now, but it provides a video um, link to the reception area. So in the event that your building is locked up, you don't have to go to a front door to let somebody in you can video him and conference them and then release the door and allow them into your uh, reception area it provides an even more enhanced security measure to our facilities thanks, <laughs> thanks Glenn. okay um, i'm going to send you back into your uh work groups again to talk uh, I, we have a time contract at, and I'm going to close this meeting at 8.30 uh, because that's what we said. But so when you get in, I'm only going to let you stay in your groups. I know you're going to not like me for this, but I'll only give you a few minutes, like maybe seven or eight minutes. So get right to the question and uh, come up with your question because we may not have time to hear from all the tables. So let's go back to our uh, small groups.
I think it worked this time and they went to all their groups. Yay. That was super fast, Kim. <sighs> so um, I think it's also um, <clears throat> there's sometimes I, there may be, and that maybe I'm perceiving something that's not there, but um, the lacking of historical context when we don't have as much time to, you know, there may be people like folks that don't really understand what all security enhancements we've done in the last 10 years or 15 years um, with regard to um, Newtown and, you know, active shooters and things like that that have been going on through audits and things like that. So um, there may be some questions related that, that they don't really, un might not understand what the security enhancements are related to. In other words, uh, historically speaking, but um, that, that may, ju may just be me. Charles, this, this is HD. Um, I think that that that's always a a challenge when uh, when you bring when you don't when you don't have bonds every two or three years when you have them six seven eight years apart is sometimes you bring in a relatively new group of committee members or community members that you that you have not shared that context with. On this issue in particular, the safety security issue in particular, I think it's pr it's probably important that we somehow frame what you just described, uh, obviously not tonight, but but somehow in a communication, come back and remind them, uh, and we can always record a, a communication, you know, do a, a video recording where you and and uh, Jeff and Glenn or whoever, maybe just kind of record and throw some slides up or throw some pictures up and just give a quick 10 minute history of of what we've done the last 10 years and how much money has been spent out of the operation, the, the M &O, uh, budget, at least the first five or six years that I was here where we were able to do that. So, and that may be, and Michelle, I don't know how you feel about that. Um, is Michelle in this group? She's probably in one of the- No, sir, we uh, just put her in room seven. She's hey, uh, Charles and HD, I think one thing that we could do is we could easily, I've got the, uh, if you recall the IBI presentation that I gave at the uh, security um, yeah. update for the board, uh, freshen that up a little bit. And I think that would be a great tool to share with the committee to let them know, because that gave a overall historical of where we were at and how far we've come mm -hmm. with the uh, safety and security at our campuses. Yeah. I, I, something, something quick, you know, five, 10 minutes of. Yeah. Um, something to look at, but I agree. I, I, agree I think it was, if I recall, I think it had eight to ten slides on that PowerPoint. Yeah, because this, this, and the, this, this type of thing, and as well as the the cameras and the technology around it, and the police department um, refurbish um, is a kind of a cornerstone of this whole thing. Is is maintaining our 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 needs on, on the safety and security side of things um, as we go forward. So I want to make sure they get they're real clear on why it's necessary. Well, not even, you know, one thing I wasn't even able to touch on tonight was our bond uh, security that we're doing on our safety film, you know? Yeah. yeah. Charles, uh, when they come back, I'm not sure what the pro what the protocol is, that Michelle will have, but if if you can slip, you know, yeah. slip what you just said in to let them know that we're going to be providing them a little bit of context somehow, and we can talk about the best way to do that. Yeah. Instead of a tour, too, we might we might do a one of those virtual tours where we just make a video. You know, here here's a cafeteria and show a cross corridor set of doors and you know the way it operates, and here's this wide open spot that they can go on into the building and kind of describe a scenario yeah it was hard. it's hard to grab a, a picture to try and take a snapshot of it in yeah. a setting like this to yeah, convey it's, it's hard it yeah no i'm not being critical at all i'm just better. no i know you're not I, it's just hard you know without with without bombarding them with boring data right
So, and I know that we've, you know, we've never really wanted to create that barrier to our, to our um, parents or, or community members that we don't want them in our buildings and we do want them in our buildings. We want them in there safely though. I think in some instances, it's also important just to show them what we need to show them, but don't show them every trick that the district has for security. You right. Know, it's, a it's, it's a fine line. And sometimes you even want to say that out loud and it, you kind of see these light bulbs go off in their head, go, oh, oh, yeah, okay, well, we need to, you know, it really comes down to that trust and that you've, you've gained from the community as a district. And I know you all have great trust with the community and you, do, you know, I don't want to say just just trust me on that, but in some instances for security reasons, you don't want to, you know, you don't necessarily want to say here's the here's the camera at the front door and we have a button and you can push it and somebody can come in here and they can go over there and we don't want them to come down here. You know, we don't necessarily want to show all the breaches that are there because they're always going to be there. There's always going to be a way to get into these schools. Guys, in 11 seconds, I'm bringing them back in. You're awesome. <clears throat> Just a reminder, as you come back in from your break rooms, if you will please mute yourself. We're supposed to wrap up in about 17 minutes. <clears throat> That's our time contract. I left the gate open. She's going to come at me. All right. I need to, I forgot to tell, are we back in the big group yet? Yes. They, yes, they are all coming back in. Yes. Okay. I, 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 because we're having to adjust a lot because of uh, last week, that's why we skipped the uh, presentation on technology, and we're actually moving that to uh, to the next meeting, which is on March 11th. So now I'm going to move through the groups. I know that a couple of you don't have any questions, and that's great because we'll get to skip that group. But let's start with uh, let's start with group eight this time. I don't want to uh, always miss those at the end of the list. Eight, did you have a question? Well, we have more of a comment, and so that's what Lynette will present. Okay, Lynette, give us a, a succinct uh, comment. Um, we were talking about the security needs, and we do believe in, in those security needs as they were mentioned out, but we were kind of questioning the um, vehicle replacement because the question was a lot of our police officers are on campuses, um, so we were questioning how big of a need that was. Well, the, the need is, is that we have to respond to call for services. And I have to have vehicles to, good running vehicles to do so. So those vehicles run consistently for eight hours each shift. And, uh, and, and along with that, I have equipment that's in those vehicles that is running, pulling electrical things and everything. And uh, I'm telling you, those officers jump curbs. They run through driveways. Uh, they're just not everyday vehicles. And after you get 75, 80,000 miles on one of those patrol cars over seven, eight years, Lynette, then they're worn out. Thanks. Thanks, Chief. Okay, let's move quickly to seven. Who, who's, do you have a question, seven? Yes, we do have a question. Let's hear 
our question is what is the research or what what made y'all come to the conclusion that enclosed libraries would be safer than leaving them open because if we think back to Columbine, there were a group of students and a teacher that were locked in the library thinking they would be safe and they ended up being sitting ducks and they were all killed aside from the teacher, I believe. So in what, how do you, you all plan to structure those enclosed libraries so that we don't have a tragedy such as that if that situation occurs? Can, can I answer that one? Um... I think what we're going to need to do um, also is uh, to frame tonight a security discussion. We're going to do like a little video and uh, some information about the historical context of how we got to where we are security wise and the dollars and the projects that we've spent in the last 15 years since, since Columbine and Newtown and, uh, the, those incidents and and it's all about the ability of the intruders access not about holding uh, students and staff in in a combined area uh, closed in area but to prevent the intruder from easily being able to traverse the building uh, and so without going through all the details of all the security mechanisms that we've installed tonight um, this is ongoing from our audits that we do every year. We do a safety audit and they, they come up with uh, recommendations um, auditing school districts all over the nation and how to stop that intruder or that perpetrator from being able to traverse the building and get to staff and students. So it's not about holding um, uh, the safe people, it's about it's about stopping the intruder or the perpetrators. Thank you, Ms. Woods. Okay, I think tables, uh, I mean, work group six was the one that did not have any, have a question. So I'm gonna move to uh, room five. Uh, Monica, I mean, Jennifer, who's your? It was me, I, I have the question. Good. Um, and I apologize in advance because I don't think this is gonna be a popular question which is that um, we remain concerned with the school prison to pipeline um, and, and understanding um, that the concern is about outside. I, I heard you, uh, Charles or Mr. Woods, um, but, but the root cause is beyond uh, intruders. And so my concern is, is the money that we would spend on police be better served as a civic service and address the root causes that our community needs versus having more police on campus? or investing at all in police on campus? That's it. That's a good question. This, this is HD. I'd like to just speak to that real briefly. And I don't know that I'm gonna answer that question, but I wanna, uh, I'd like to provide at least kind of where our thinking is. Uh, I, the, the, the delicate balance that we have right now, uh, we being just schools in general, but the delicate balance we have right now with uh, the current um, environment with taking a look at what you just described was uh, instead of trying to react to what got a student or to an individual to get them to that point, um, you know, where would we be better served as a society? Would we be better served as a community? Would we be better served as a school district to allocate and to uh, dedicate resources to preventive measures versus what you know, reacting, reactive measures. And there's a ton of, ton of uh, credit. I mean, there's a ton of, of, uh, of rational reasons why that should be part of the consideration. The, the resources that would be used to do things like that don't necessarily come from a bond fund. Uh, the discussion about whether we should have a police department or whether we should not have a police department is, uh, is, is, is obviously a fair open discussion item, but, but, the, the bigger issue is what are we doing to prevent things like that? What are we doing for, for, for uh, preventive education for staff and students? And we can continue doing that, but there has to be this delicate balance between law enforcement and what, you know, the role that they play and, uh, and the issues that you're describing. So I'm not meaning to dance around that question or that topic. It's, it's, it's front and center on, and, and, and every leaders, uh, every mayor, every governor, every, county judge who oversees law enforcement that uh, and every superintendent who has a police police department but I would uh, 
I would, I would, I will tell you that this is that we'll be glad to talk about this more, uh, but we'll have to be really sensitive to what is what it what can be done and what can be utilized with capital funds through a bond process versus things that would be used and and and, and utilized in, with uh, M and O money. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful or not, but that, but I, I would acknowledge the question, acknowledge the issue, and acknowledge that that it's not a it's it's not out of bounds. The question is not out of bounds at all. Thank Thanks, you. Dr. Chambers. Let's uh, go to take to Marla's uh, four, and if y'all can uh, speed this, uh, make this as quick as you can. Who had the question for uh, tape for room four? Uh, Chris Bent. This is Chris Bent. I have a question. It's very a very quick question. Um, what happens to the police old police vehicles once they're taken out of service? Police vehicles, just like uh, school buses or any other ve district vehicles, uh, were required to auction them off uh, as as uh, used equipment that uh, we can't we can we could use them internally if we wanted if they were safe enough, but they they can't be uh, they can't be sold person to person. They have to be done sold or or removed by auction only. Thank you, Mister. Okay, uh, table, room three, Shannon. Yeah, uh, so our concern was in our question, um, we were just interested in what was the process that you guys uh, had in prioritizing the security items, uh, particularly the uh, building modifications. Um, yeah, just what was the process for, for, for determining the, the uh, Priorities. Who's taking that? I, I'm not sure if Glenn is, is on. Um, I think his internet may have failed him. Um, what I will say is, uh, it's, it's Aaron, correct? Uh, as you heard uh, Mr. Woods talk, that the uh, safety security upgrades have been a process throughout time. So we have had several phases of upgrades. So the upgrades that you've talked about about the securing the buildings, it was really the, a phase that we didn't get to in previous, um, in previous um, upgrades of, of earlier years. So this would be the next level to secure uh, these buildings in these open areas. So they, they have been on the list. We, we could not get to them in the previous list, so. Thank you, Hilda. Okay, let's move to Julie's tape, uh, tape room two. It wasn't that Julie? Yes, and I'm gonna speak on behalf of our group. Um, we, we didn't have any questions, but we, we just felt like everything that was presented in regards to safety and security of staff and students was very important. Okay, thanks, Lucia. Okay, let's move to Daryl's group, uh, work group number one. That'd be Charles Hudson, uh, go by Chuck. Um, first of all, we were wondering, since a lot of the, um, the items as far as the vehicles and the communications equipment seem to be state or city requirements for you for mutual aid or being able to help other organizations out, have we reached out to the state for any funding for those for that equipment that seems some of it seems to be a state funded or needed to be a state funded item i can tell you they was non-funded mandates and uh, we were required to follow what the larger municipal and county departments receive i can't tell you but i can tell you that uh, my department uh, did comply and uh, the district uh, funded uh, what we needed. There's there's very little state funding for school districts who have their own police department. You, you, you base your funding and you allocate your funding for those for those districts who do have a police department like we do. Um, we we just we make that a part of our priority and, and part of the, the the way in which we budget for for safety and security. I don't think there's ever been a governor's grant uh, for law enforcement that we haven't applied for and received. Um, 
with 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 um, bulletproof vests, and um, there has been technology grants uh, before, and uh, safety film for for glass for glass, and there's been all kinds of uh, of grants we've taken advantage of, but uh, there haven't been any for this particular set of items that that are listed. The va the vast majority of public school funding is based on per student. And safety and security is not based on any per student funding. It's uh, just as a citizen, as a citizen, as a taxpayer, regardless of whether you're you're participating in this bond process. But as a citizen, you 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 should be concerned that, that your local school district, whether it's A Leaf or anywhere else, that the state of Texas doesn't fund safety and security. It's 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 a part of our budget. So even as though they are state certified peace officers. Yes, sir. That's correct. I mean, there's as Mr. Wood said, there's grants that we can go out and apply for, but they're that's just what they are. They're grants. They're one-time, they're one-time grants. In terms of a systematic, consistent way of funding, so that we know how to budget, um, uh, the state of Texas has not placed that as a priority. Thank you, Mr. Cambridge. Okay, but so that we can honor our time contract, I think there are two uh, remaining important things, and the first one, I believe. Craig, you had a, a, a very sad announcement to make to the committee. I'm actually going to let our superintendent, uh, since he's on with us now, he would like to uh, address this. Yeah, um, and I, I, I apologize I wasn't here at the very at the beginning of the at the beginning of the meeting, but um, I wanted to just reiterate, uh, I think, a note that Craig sent out to to, to everyone, but. Uh, our committee lost lost one of our committee members uh, a few days. Mr. Mike Cronston passed away of a massive heart attack. And um, for those that have been in Ailey for a long time, you know Mike. You know Mike and his family. His his daughter Colleen works in our curriculum assessment and our research department. Uh, her husband, his son-in-law, is an associate principal. Brian Br Brown is an associate principal at Hastings High School. Um, just a just a long time solid supporter of a leaf and Hastings in particular. <laughs> yeah, um, just just solid guy, solid man. He was on our 2015 bond steering committee. He was in our meeting back in our first meeting. He was in it. As a matter of fact, he asked a couple of questions. Um, but I just uh, again keep keep that family in your thoughts and your prayers. And um, uh, a leaf lost a good one. This community lost a good one. We lost a, a good one, it's not just this committee, but this, this community lost a good man. So uh, anyway, I, I just wanted to recognize him one more time. He's uh, Thank you, HD, and, and I'm so, so sorry. Um, I know he'll be missed by the committee, but especially by his family and the whole community. Um, Mr. Ryland, would you like to uh, address our group before we Dismiss. Yeah, well, I, I share and offer my condolences to to the to the ones we've lost, but also I want to really thank this group tonight. I Man, there was a lot of work done tonight, uh, a lot of engagement, a lot of deep conversations, a lot of good questions and good comments, and you can really tell uh, that this group is invested in understanding the process, understanding the issues, and making sure that they are coming to the right. Uh, conclusions and, and suggestions. So I just want to, again, not only thank you for, for hanging out with us for a couple of hours, but, but the type of work uh, that you put in tonight really demonstrated that you are committed to this process and committed to doing the right thing. So I just want to thank you guys for that and uh, be safe out there and, and uh, we'll see you at our next meeting. Thank you. And thank you, committee. Look forward to seeing you on March 11th. Good night. Take care.